Welcome to the Human Experience Podcast, the only podcast designed to fuse your left and right brain hemispheres and feed it the most entertaining and mentally engaging topics on the planet. As we approach our ascent, please make sure your frontal, temporal and occipital lobes are in their full upright position. As you take your seat of consciousness, relax your senses and allow us to take you on a journey. We are the Intimate Strangers. Thank you for listening. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to yet another live episode of The Human Experience. I'm actually really starting to like these live episodes that we've been doing for you guys. Our guest today, it's a very phenomenal story. He dove headfirst into a very curious quest that we are going to hear right now. My guest's name is Kostas Danaus. And the book is called The Magus of Java, The Teachings of an Authentic Taoist Immortal. Kostas, my good sir, welcome to HXP. Thank you, Xavier. Nice to be here. So, Kostas, I read this book last night, and wow, I mean, it's it's truly a fascinating read. I, I gotta ask you, well, let's let's you know, I'm getting right into the cut of it but let's 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 back up a little bit you what was what was the few, let's t- tell the audience a little bit about yourself and who you are please well that's a complex question uh i i like to think i'm just uh, a simple person who is interested in a lot of different things uh i've done martial arts forever uh i have degrees in two fields of engineering i've worked for uh, the defense industry, for the software industry, I've worked in academia. Uh, at the moment, I'm working for the software industry in an executive position. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm just a guy that uh, likes to do a lot of different things. Hmm. You know, it's, it's intriguing. So, so then, you know, t- tell me, let's bring it into, you know, this, this call into action, you know, this story arc of this journey, this quest for you that began for you, because, you know, you, you did, you, so, I mean, by trade, you, you are, you're an engineer, you're a scientist, right? I mean, would you call yourself a skeptic? Uh, I would, no, I think my mind is much more open to that. I would, I would call myself uh, somebody that would, like to see logic uh, prevail as opposed to, you know, belief. Okay, understood. So, you know, b- before you started this journey, it was more, you know, you, but you were, you know, you were an engineer, so you wanted to see the, the logic of things. Well, you know, uh, th- that's the case. Um, this particular journey uh, has to do with a, with a conversation we had uh uh, when we were offline, is uh, that if you remember, we discussed uh, why you were doing this, and you mm. said you wanted to know more about life. Uh, mm-hmm. At that time, uh, I had worked in the defense industry for a number of years, and it was right after the first Iraq War. So uh, I was also questioning the quote unquote meaning of life and wanted to look into a lot of different things. And, and that's basically what, uh, what began this quest that was trying to find some answers to questions I think that have plagued all of us for a very long time. Hmm. Okay. So let's get, let's get into it then. So John Chang, you know, right there. I I saw him. I saw him on a documentary. You saw, you saw him on a a documentary. Tell us, Mm -hmm. tell us about the documentary. What, what moved you to drop everything and go to Indonesia? Um, well, like I said, I heard I had already dropped everything uh, just prior to that, and I, and I was in a phase where I was looking for answers, and it just happened that I saw this documentary on television and thought that wow, this is really intriguing. I've I've got the time, I've got the money. Why not uh, Why not look around and and see if I can find anything there? And and what I saw was a documentary by two brothers for the BBC talking to an, uh, a Chinese-Indonesian uh, acupuncturist who was doing amazing things uh, with his body, let's say, mm-hmm. controlling the, the energies of his body. Mm-hmm. He was able to generate uh, an electric current 
and use it uh, both to heal and as a means of defense. Okay. And it, there was, but in in the documentary itself, there there were these things that you noticed, and it compelled you to find him. Yeah, there 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 were. Okay, speaking as an engineer, for example, the. Uh, the reaction that uh, one of the Blair brothers had on touching him uh, could not be readily rep- uh, replicated. Uh, it was very natural. Uh, there were other things that convinced me that it hadn't been staged, uh, more so because I understand a little bit uh, also about how things uh, could be staged and, and how the wiring would have to work in order for it to. Uh, in any case, the the documentary convinced me. I got on a plane and wound up in Indonesia. Okay, so so lay the stage for us. You, you're in Indonesia. Do you have any idea of where you're going or or? Not a clue. I, I don't speak a, a word of the language. I've never been to Indonesia before. Uh, I knew two things. Number one, that he was Chinese. And therefore, uh, if you understand the, uh, the culture and the history of the nation, you know that uh, this particular demographic lives in very segregated communities. So the first thing that I did when I went to uh, Jakarta is try to find uh, where the Chinese lived. And then again, logic, as we said, I, I reasoned um, if there has to be a temple where, where somebody knows Uh, about this man. So I very deliberately set out to find a Chinese neighborhood, which was Glodok, and uh, and find a uh, Taoist temple and start asking questions like a moron. You know, hi, I'm a dumb foreigner here. I don't speak a word of your language, but I'm looking for this guy. Do you know him? And uh, it kind of worked after a while. So, And eventually you get to what I would call, you know, the gatekeepers, like these people who are sort of on the outskirts of learning from John, the master John Chang directly, and mm-hmm. they're screening you, they're vetting you. Exactly. They, they thought I was a spy from the CIA. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I mean, and so, so, you know, so eventually you get to meet this guy that you've been looking for this whole time, John Chang, the master. Correct. And, you know, what was your, what was your impression of, of him? Well, initially? I remember. I remember being stunned. Um, he, uh, you know, he's, he's, a, he's a very small man. Uh, I'm 6'2", and he was about half that size. Uh, uh, very humble, very uh, unassuming. Um, also very wealthy, to, to, to make a point. He uh, had managed to make quite a fortune uh, in the uh, trade business. Uh, import export and and therefore uh, he would offer his acupuncture services for free every day to to anyone that walked through his door so he uh, by means of introduction showed me uh, the energy that that he could generate uh, he asked me if I had any particular problems I, I had uh, some tendonitis serious tendonitis uh, at that time uh, so he treated me for that and and that was a uh, Quite an experience, let's say, feeling that uh, basically it's like being connected to a uh, an outlet, an electrical outlet, and uh, it going on and on and on. Right. I mean, I, I'm glad you mentioned electricity because you know, 300 years ago, anyone that talked about electricity, we would call them and we would call them crazy. You you would say, you right. know, what are you talking about? So, yeah. so uh, y- you know, so you you. You're you're experiencing this this healing. Did you feel as if there was something special about this man when you met him and when you encountered him? When I saw him, I mean, if if he was walking down the street, sure, I I wouldn't look twice at him. Okay, okay. There, there was there was uh, there was nothing that uh, that distinguished him from anyone else. At what point in this did you decide I want to apprentice with this person? Oh, I wanted to apprentice with him before I went to Indonesia. That was the whole point. You know, I wanted to uh, figure out how he could do that. I, I had studied uh, Tibetan Buddhism for a number of years uh, before then, where similar physical phenomena manifest as heat. So 
uh, the the Tumo meditation uh, had been documented by Herbert Benson of Harvard, going all the way back to 1981. And and again, the interesting thing with the Tumo med- uh, meditation is that it also disrupts the boundaries of what is considered uh, possible for human physiology. Because if uh, you know the, these monks generate intense heat and protect uh, themselves in, in, in cold at a very high altitude and uh, the test that they use is that they have to dry seven sheets, if I remember correctly. So they're in the, in the middle of uh, of a uh, winter field in the snow at 5,000 meters elevation. And, you know, the, the novices go and they dip uh, blankets in, uh, in freezing cold water. And then they put them on these monks. And, and the documentaries actually show heat rising, you know, as, as, the, as the water evaporates. And to get the title of Repa to be able to uh, qualify for for their uh, their senior status, they they have to dry seven sheets. If I remember correctly, don't hold me to this because mm-hmm. uh, it's been a long time. But but I knew that that the mind could affect um, human physiology and exceed uh, the boundaries because I, I had direct experience of that even before I went to to see uh, John Chang and. Uh, so his particular manifestation of that, of, of, uh, of the power of the mind, was, was quite intriguing because uh, it could be used for therapeutic purposes. It could be used for martial purposes. Uh, it was, uh, let's say, one step more than the, the cap- capabilities of the monks, okay. if you exclude enlightenment from the, uh, from the uh, picture because uh, what the monks are doing are... are for religious reasons, they're they're trying to dissolve the knots uh, of the uh, of their internal makeup so that they can uh, reach enlightenment. Uh, hmm. The the Mopai method is something that's a little bit different, similar but different. Okay, so I just I just played this video of mm-hmm. John Chang, and he has his hand over this newspaper, yeah. and he sets it on fire. Yep. You know how how would you say? he's doing this what what is this energy called that he's using well the energy that he's using is called chi uh, theoretically what he does is that he provides it in such a concentrated uh, and and focused amount that he's able to to generate uh, the the heat the required heat to to set the the paper on fire Um, There are a number of videos of him being tested by scientists for the electrogeneration, which is a a term that I coined. Uh, You could, you know, by uh, just extend that verified, let's say, ability and say that he can focus it like a laser and, and set a newspaper on fire. So this is the chi is an internal energy. It's it's like an internal electricity that there's a positive and negative force that he's transmitting externally out of his body. Are you asking me as a physicist? Are you asking me as Costas? Are you asking me? <laughs> how are you asking me to, to describe? I'm asking this? in your own experience. You know what 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 is what is going on here? I mean. Well, it feels like electricity, but it's not measurable uh, on a uh, voltmeter or amp meter. And uh, he was only able to light a particular type of LED. Hmm. Uh, so I don't know what it is or how it manifests. How, how do you move your hand? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So well, No, seriously, Xavier, how do you move your hand? I mean, it's just an electrical signal that I'm sending it's into your brain. It's an electrical signal that you know your brain cortex. generates. Right. The electrical signal that the I'm that, thinking uh, it, runs and so down it happens. Your arm. Correct. Right? Yes. Right. And are you thinking it first and then it happens? or I mean, how do you decide to move your hand? Who are you? <laughs> yeah. Is, I mean, it, is it the neurons that are firing in order to... So, you know, you start... Going into questions like this, uh, and you're you're really asking questions about the fundamental nature of our our existence. Sure. I mean, uh, do, do we exist independent of the physical form? I mean, uh, do you decide to move your hand the the instant that the neurons are fired? And if so, why are those neurons firing? Who tells them what to do? Right. You know, and 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 if if this is a question 
uh, that can be answered. Is it the same energy? Is it the same medium that, that, uh, as the electricity that, that we've measured that courses uh, through our neurons? Uh, I don't know. I can't answer any of these questions. I mean, it's just uh, idle speculation. So, you know, this, you know, John Chang, this master that you studied under, he, mm -hmm. he said, w was he any different? Did he pretend to be any different than anyone else? Did he, did he claim himself to be superhuman or any of those things? Define superhuman. Superhuman with some sort of special ability. Like some, so maybe it's a genetic mutation that allows him, gives no. him special powers. No. So this is something that uh, he attained. A, he, he was not. He was not born that way. He attained it through uh, practice and perseverance. Okay. So, so would you say that it's possible for anyone to attain this ability, these abilities? I definitely say that it's not possible for anyone to attain any more than it is possible for anyone to become a uh, a Tibetan Buddhist Repa or a fighter pilot. There sure. are certain prerequisites that have to be in place in order for a person to qualify to be able to complete the training and, and assume the role. Uh, a lot of people wash out, a lot of people get hurt, uh, and it's uh, the training is very dangerous. I, I know in, uh, for example, in Tibetan Buddhism, I believe uh, it was one in seven that succeeded. And I can tell you from the Mopai training that uh, a lot of people got sick that I know. Some of them are dead. So, you know, it's it's not, no, not everyone can, can complete this training the same way that not everyone can uh, become a heavyweight champion of the world and the same way not everyone can become a fighter pilot. There, there are prerequisites that have to be put in place uh, in order for someone to, to achieve this. I don't know what they are. I couldn't tell you, you know, that there's no... Uh, characterization of what's required in order to to be able to be like this. So you would you would liken it to like an Olympic athlete that is highly specialized in what they do. They they've focused. They've trained. They've whether it's meditation or something else. It's something they've practiced over and over, and they're just good at doing. Yeah, I would put it beyond that. I, I'm uh, 60 years old. I've been playing music for 53 years. I'm terrible at it. So no amount of practice or perseverance has uh, ever allowed me to become a, a musician uh, the way that I would like to be. Uh, therefore, uh, there is a genetic component to it, a, uh, a karmic, if you will. You know, there's, there's just something that says that you are born to do this particular thing in addition to all the training and perseverance and whatnot that you're going to put into it. Okay, so let's let's step back a little bit. Okay, so sure. at, at some point, you know, like you 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 ask Master Chang to take you on as a, an apprentice, and he he just says no to you. Right. And how long did that go on? How long did he tell you no? Forty days. <laughs> and I mean, was he testing something in you? Was there something he was giving you some sort of challenge to overcome with that? Beats me. I I, I showed up at his doorstep every day for 40 days he treated me for free he fed me and sent me home and every day i asked him again will you accept me as a no yeah so you just you know you just kept coming back and yeah and you weren't going to leave well i would have left eventually but you know <laughs> I, I i didn't leave in the uh time frame that that he thought uh and and uh it was actually quite touching uh because when he said yes, I, I said, uh, you know, finally expecting, okay, here it is. And now where am I going to go this weekend? Okay, it's been, you know, it was like a Friday or something like that. So like, it's really cool. You know, I haven't been here and uh, I know he's not here. So, and oh, by the way, will you accept me? You know, will you, uh, I didn't say accept me as a student. I said, uh, uh, I want you to reconsider uh, about teaching me or something like that. I, I don't remember the exact wording. And then uh, he came back and he said, Actually, I'm already teaching you. Mm. And, and then, poof, you know, it was a shock. And uh, really? Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. So, so when he offered to treat your joint problems, that was your first <clears throat> experience of his ability to heal. That's correct. And did you, did you find that you, you experienced you know, some healing oh, yeah. quality? 
Oh yeah, he got he got rid of the the uh, pain and the uh, the tendonitis at the time. And what did it feel like? I mean, was it an electrical current that you felt was going running through your body, or what what uh, sensation did you have? Most certainly, it felt like an electrical current, and it hurt like hell. Huh. You know, you know, I think it's I think it's interesting that this. I don't know, would you call it an art form? Would, I mean, what is, it, it's a practice, right? But, I mean, is it a type, because it's it's mixed with martial arts, and there yes. seems to be this parallel of healing, but also, you know, combat. Uh, yeah, I, I don't think that they uh, differentiated between the two. Um, there, there's, there's some things about China that, that uh, people don't really understand, and, and, and we have that, that problem today in general um, that our sense of history uh, has been forgotten. So you have to understand this is the, the age of empires still, right? I mean, uh, all the way up to the early 20th century, what, uh, what we grew up with, uh, I'm talking about people in my generation, um, I, I won't even touch uh, what, what, what younger people experience, but... Um, we grew up very much in the era of nation states and of the Cold War. So, you know, there were lines that, that were firmly put in place. But in the age of empires before then, so you had a, a distribution of uh, Chinese nationals throughout the Pacific Rim without a clear distinction that, you know, I'm an Indonesian or I'm a Malay or I'm a, or a, a native Chinese or I'm Taiwanese. or whatever. They were just spread all over. And one could argue about San Francisco the same way, too. So... What this caused is a tremendous diffusion uh, and dispersion of the knowledge base. So China is was never one thing back then. There, there were distinguishing characteristics uh, as much as there are between a, a Norwegian and a Greek, say. You know, it was a, could be entirely different cultures within a, uh, a different uh, – within the same uh, geography. Also – uh, they are not a people who are selfless. My experience with the Chinese uh, is that pretty much personal gain is considered very much uh, above everything else. Now, with the Confucian ethic, that diverts backwards uh, to the seniors in the family, then to the seniors in the tribe and the ancestors and so forth and so on. But what that means is that information was not shared very readily because knowledge is power. So mm -hmm. what the experience that people have today of acupuncture, of Chinese medicine, was a, an, attempt, an attempt by Mao Zedong to normalize, to, to westernize, if you will, the knowledge base. And what he did is he took different cultural traditions – and, and try to fuse them together to make a central axis. Well, that's like, you know, trying to uh, fuse rap with country western with classical. Yeah, maybe it'll work out and, and great. You know, I mean, I've heard some, uh, some songs that, that attempt uh, this type of thing, and, and it's wonderful. But I've also heard a lot of crap from people who are trying to do this thing. So uh, when you're trying to fuse different conditions and different traditions, different knowledge bases... Uh, by force, nominally it doesn't work, and and this is the China that that John Chan grew up in. So it wasn't a China where there's Malaysia and Indonesia and China. No, no, no. The entire Pacific Rim was settled by Chinese. They were uh, cultural groups in the diaspora that kept in touch with each other, that knew each other, that were from a particular region, that believed in different things, and this knowledge was selectively dispersed to members of the community that they chose, never broadly, never never widely across. And and uh, you can see that everywhere. Uh, there, there are a lot of effects, uh, a lot of uh, examples uh, of this being the case. Uh, I'm uh, good friends with uh, Master uh, Chen Xiaowang of the Chen Tai Chi uh, tradition, who was also my teacher for a number of years. And to hear his stories of the way that he was brought up in, in Chen Village and the way he learned Tai Chi and how it's taught today, even by him, you know, through the government agencies, it's exactly 
what I just described. So, you know, you have something that's a close-knit family tradition where maybe the real knowledge, the particular details, uh, because, you know, let's face it, if you're, if you're trying to solve an algebraic uh, equation and you're missing uh, mm -hmm. two of the uh, denominators, you're not going to solve it ever. You know, you need to, to have a complete picture. Sure. So a, a lot of the problems we have uh, in the West with understanding this type of these types of practices, whether they be Tibetan or Chinese or something else, is that they were never normalized. They were never structured to be taught. They were never disseminated in a broad manner. They were always passed on, you know, in very close knit groups. So you don't really know what you're getting, what you're seeing, what you're. There's no characterization of it. You can't go to a, a university and get your degree in this and, and choose what courses. No, that hasn't been done. It's folk medicine. You know? It reminds me of uh, sort of like the caste system in yeah. India. It, yeah, it, but, would you... but, but there were no castes. It, it, it was a family thing. You know, it was little, little groups of people that decided that they liked each other. You know, and, and, and the castes might have been fighting within themselves. You know, I mean, if you, if you read uh, the book, the stories that John Chang was telling me, most of these people didn't like each other. They were, they were fighting each other, trying to kill each other, you know, to see, to prove who was the most powerful. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it was very different uh, from what, uh, what we expect. And uh, part of the problems uh, that we have with that in the West is that we try to project our own cultural background, our own conclusions, our own expectations, if you will, uh, on their particular uh, cultural subset, and it just doesn't work. I I appreciate I appreciate the macrocosmic sort of perspective. And, you know, something I meant to ask you: What year was it when you went to Java, Indonesia? Like, what? what... Nineteen ninety-four. So, I mean, it was a different time back then. And oh, absolutely. <laughs> yes. In what sense was it different? Okay, I think I've just been talking all about all that, but okay. uh, the the world was. Uh, was very different uh, before the end of the Cold War and transitioned into the 90s and completely changed again after 9-11. Uh, so uh, it was different in that uh, there wasn't as much violence around the world as, as there was. We had just gone through a very uh, strong period of growth uh, and development, which was the 60s through the 80s. Uh, it was a boom time, but for example, uh, when I went there in, in 94, uh, the next year, uh, Indonesia was caught in an insurrection where they were, uh, the populace was turning against the, both the Chinese, uh, and, uh, against Suharto, uh, who the dictator who had supported them for, for 40 years. So, uh, many of my brother students at that time were, were caught up in the riots. I mean, I witnessed the riots myself, you know, and that people were hiding in their houses and, uh, and they couldn't come out or their their livelihoods were being smashed and and this is a transition that that uh, that you could see from one moment to the next it was a different world in that back then people were were still let's say at the tail end of the of the spirit that uh, was first developed in the 60s which was one of sharing and, and transition and uh, trying to look out for for each other and and now I'm afraid that that's no longer there Hmm. Okay. And, you know, it, it didn't worry you. Like, you, you weren't afraid about, you know, going into this, this country, not having any idea. You just kind of went for it? Um, I used to do that for a living, so I, I wasn't really particularly afraid of that, no. Okay. So, so let's, let's move back into, you know, the system of learning that you encountered. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there, there are levels to this system. Correct. Um, how many levels are there? 72, if I remember correctly. And you completed the whole 72? Oh, no. God, no. No, 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 not even close. Why no. such a sharp reaction? What? Uh, the, the uh, I think at that time, John Chang might have been level 18, if I remember correctly. So what level did you get to? Uh, that's personal information, and I'd love to share it, but so many people want to know the answer to that question that the smug and belligerent parts, uh, part of me wants me to not tell you that, although it's not a big deal, but, you know, uh, because uh, people like to turn it into a competition, okay. you know, uh, my guy reached this level, your guy didn't, so sure. 
sure. I never answer enough. that question. Yeah. Okay. So, um, you know, would you relate this level system to the chakra system in the in the human body? Uh, to some extent, yes. Uh, more so to the chakra and nadi system than the than the chakra system itself. So, uh, I, like I said, I've also studied uh, the Tibetan Naropa yogas, which are very much focused on the uh, seven center line chakras. These, the Mopai system is more focused on the peripheral uh, points all around the center line, as well as the center line, but, but, but it's a bit more diverse and distributed. It has um, different end goals than the system that, again, has been uh, brought to the West and popularized through uh, almost 100 years now of, of writings of uh, esoteric authors. So, mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. okay. So, so level one. Let's start with right. level one. Uh, I mm -hmm. mean, this this involves filling the simple dunce. simple meditation. That's all it is. Meditation, meditation and breathing. Meditation and breathing. Proper breathing, coupled with meditation. Okay. Level two. Mm -hmm. Pressurizing the chi that you have filled your dantian with in level one until it becomes a hard little ball, and then starting to move that ball. Uh, left, right, up, and down. Okay. In Ex an X. Explain X, that to actual. me one more time in a different way, please. So you're you're pushing out a ball of energy through the Dantian, like a. You are you you're you're okay. So I imagine that most of your uh, listeners know what the Dantian is. So let's imagine that you have a Dantian, which um, one of the Mopai seniors postulated was the end of the umbilical cord when uh, when we're a baby so therefore one of the first cells formed in the, in the human body and uh, you fill that up with chi whatever chi is and then once you're filled uh, you start compressing it so that it becomes a little hard ball and you do that with uh, specific breathing breath retention and meditation again Okay, okay. And so And then you start moving it around. You start moving it around so that for example, you can drive your that energy into your hands, into your legs. You you control where it's flowing. So, you know, what's the difference between uh yin and yang? I mean, there's there's t there's this t there's it's like a positive and negative flow, right? Very easy question to answer. You know what the sun is, right? Sure. Great. You see it every morning. Do you know what a black hole is? Yeah, it's a, uh, you know, uh, a point of gravitational pull that's larger than, you know, even light can't escape it. Right. It, it's a pronounced uh, concentration of a gravitational well in such that uh, the mass actually collapses within the, the hole. So there's, you know, it's, it has infinite mass, let's say. Um, so, but you've never seen one because if you did, you'd be dead because you couldn't get close to one. So we postulate what it is because a very brilliant mathematician described it to us using a, a language that, uh, can be replicated, uh, through our disciplines, uh, through Western science and mathematics. But, uh, I think it was just recently that they, uh, an optical image of a black hole was for the first time made public, right? So it looks like we expected it to. Um, so yin and yang is like that. Yang is the sun, which you can see. You know, it's there. You can feel its energy. You go out, lay on a beach. You know what all the sun is about. But can you really tell me what gravity is? I mean, how can you describe it? It pulls you down, yeah, so you know its effects, but you don't really know what it is, do you? And a, bl and a black hole is even worse. You couldn't describe it to save your life. So yin is like that, and yang is like the sun. Okay, okay. So so what's happening in the human body when you're channeling? I mean, which which of the energy are you channeling? Only yang, only yang. So so yang is the the creative force, would you say? That's correct, yeah. Uh, in order to channel yin, you have to be like Jan Chan. 
that's that's the whole point of the of the discipline is to be able to control the yin force as well. The rest of us can only control yang. So in level two, the students mm-hmm. were tested uh, through the usage of telekinesis. If you want to call it that, yeah, okay. You were you were moving objects with your mind. No, we were trying to push our chi to a suitable distance where it can generate a feeble enough force to blow over a piece of paper. So you were moving objects, I mean, with this energy. Right. Not with my mind. I wasn't sitting there and uh, concentrating and they would just fall over. Okay. It, it, took, it took a lot of physical effort in order for it to happen. Des- describe the process. I mean, so you, you're pushing out this yang force out of the dantian and then into the up, object? Up to your heart? No. Up to your heart. You, you pull it in from your dantian up to your heart and then out of your palm towards the particular object in, in question. Okay. And, you, you know, how long did it take you to get to this point where you were able to physically impact or affect an object? Oh, quite a number of years. Uh, uh, can't remember right now. It's like five, I mean, five or six years. Probably. What did the training involve? Like, you know, what were you doing inside? What were you meditating on? Uh, you were doing breathing, compression, breath retention, and meditation. It, you weren't praying to anything. It was it was purely a physiological. Uh, transformation within the body. Huh. It, no mantras, no prayers, no nothing like that. You hold your breath, you move a certain way, you do certain movements, you try to push the energy out your palm. How you know? How long did it take you to get to a point where you moved, you know, a pack of cigarettes, for example? I don't think I've ever moved a pack of cigarettes. Uh, it was a I video was curtain a- for me. Okay. No, no, it was a video carton. You know, you remember video cassettes? Sure. There was these things that we used to plug into video players, you know, block, Blockbuster and all that sure. way back in the day. Yeah. Uh, so everyone had those things laying around, and uh, that's what we used. How long did I, it... I don't to, to be honest, I, I don't remember, Xavier. It, uh, I could, you know, whatever I'd be telling you now would, would be, uh, I'd be reaching four years, five years, something like that. But it wasn't 20 years. I mean, it was... Yeah, uh, it was a uh, reasonable amount of time. But you, I mean, you saw, you saw, uh, John. You saw, you saw him levitate. Uh, mm-hmm. You, I mean, he was he was off of the ground levitating. So he yeah. was he was he was pushing this energy what underneath his feet and it was holding him up in the air. No clue. <laughs> no clue. And and uh, how do you know that? Uh, he was levitating or making me see him levitate, you know. Yeah. I don't know. It wasn't done in a lab, you know. I mean, I was just describing things that I saw and experienced. That's, that's, it's really funny because most of the people that uh, I discussed the book with, uh, for example, they say, oh, you know, you wrote that uh, John's master had a fight with the other guy and they, they tore a, a forest around, you know, the jungle down around them. I said, yep. And he goes, that can't be true. And well, I, I don't know if it's true or not. I was sitting on the guy's porch and he was telling me a story. And that's what the book is saying. You know, I mean, uh, whether or not it's true, I doubt that uh, even he knows. He heard it from his teacher. So you, you have to differentiate between what, regardless of uh, whether or not it's written in the book as a personal experience. I mean, I cannot uh, say what is true and what is not true. Uh, other than than the things that I have tested myself scientifically, so, so in this case I can tell you that I saw this and yep. So it's empirical. So, I mean, we're not we're, we're not exactly. in a lab setting. That's a good we're, word. That's a good we're word. We're not you know we're not able to test this objectively. We we can't even reproduce the results you know accurately enough to say this is what was going on. Correct. However, other disciplines such as uh, Tibetan Dumo have been tested in the lab. There was a, uh, which anyone can read, 
if you look up Herbert Benson's work going all the way back to 1981, a couple years ago, I think uh, it was 2005, a uh, yogi called uh, Pralalad Jani from, uh, in, in India went into a testing uh, chamber and didn't eat and didn't drink and, and didn't pee for about 40 days until he got tired and, and uh, he ran off. And these things have been clinically documented. I mean, uh, these people agreed to, to do it in the laboratory and therefore they're parts of the literature. So, um, you know, what, what can I say for, for, for John as far as uh, clinical uh, trials are concerned? Uh, I know that uh, he's been tested with machinery by multiple uh, Scientists, uh, it's online also as far as uh, the electrogeneration is uh, concerned. And I know what I saw was uh, my uh, co-student uh, Handoko's leg, which was uh, thinner than my wrist, mm -hmm. crippled by, by polio at the age of four. And over a period of three years, it became a normal leg. So that's something that I will never forget that's clinically documented because uh, the man has his before and after uh, examinations uh, and and it should it's it's not unfortunately a part of the literature but it should be but that's something that I can testify to seeing myself as, as hard evidence and knowing it's true because you know like uh, the Apostle Thomas uh, I put my hands on it you know I saw it I measured it it happened in front of me it wasn't it couldn't have been uh, hypnosis, it couldn't have been hysteria, it couldn't have been uh, uh, a magician's trickery. You know, I mean, David Blaine, David Blaine levitated. What's the other guy's name? The other Dave? Uh, Darren Brown? Uh, no, no, another David. Uh, uh, Copperfield? Could David Copperfield levitated, you know? Sure. So, yeah, they did it. Lots of people saw them, you know? I mean, uh, it, it's... Uh, unless something is established in a laboratory, it's simply uh, an empirical first-person uh, experience and, and should not be considered more than that. Okay, fair enough. So, so I mean, so why write the book then? I mean, why, why spread this information? Very good question. Very good question. Probably the, 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 the best question I've ever been asked. So, um, since in the last 15 years, maybe even the last 20 years, uh, very many things, bad things, that uh, far wiser, uh, more knowledgeable, and certainly more talented people than myself had foreseen uh, that were coming are happening. Okay, the, uh, the environment is uh, degrading. We fill the oceans with plastics. Climate change is, can no longer be contested. Uh, human society has become us versus them on all fronts. Mm -hmm. We are entering into a period that uh, I long ago uh, called the decline. Mm -hmm. And it's a cyclical thing. It happens. Uh, I saw it coming in the 90s. I wanted to do my part uh, to, to combat it. I foolishly thought, being a younger man at the time, that uh, trying to emphasize spirituality in the world would prevent uh, or contribute towards ameliorating the effects of, of what I saw uh, coming. But unfortunately, the, the opposition is, is far better organized than well-wishers. And uh, we need to deal with what's happening now, and, and we need to deal with it aggressively. I was just hoping that I could do my part to, to have people consider that, hey, what you're living is, is not all there is, that, that there's much more to you, to society, to our potential, to, you know, to anything that we can hope for. Okay, so, so the book for you was written as a sort of message to humanity, in a way? Yeah, that, that, that sounds far more pompous than, than I intended, but, but yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. You know, it, it's just, uh, it was a... Uh, uh, a letter of hope, let's say, a missive of hope that, uh, you know. Did it work? It helped a lot of people. Uh, okay. I don't know what it means uh, to, uh, you know, did it work when in, in the initial uh, stages of, of being uh, Cosas de Naos, it was uh, very popular. Um, 
a lot of people uh, wrote me very touching letters uh, about how it affected their lives. Uh, I think I personally helped uh, quite a few people, uh, maybe a couple hundred with, with different uh, things. And then it just became too much because the the demands of uh, of people far exceed one's capacity to uh, to help them, and and I couldn't cope anymore. So I just you know closed that part of uh, my life down and and reverted back to being a normal person. Okay, so I mean, I mean, we talked a little bit about this. Uh, just in the, in the small amount of contact that we have had before mm-hmm. the show, and you said yeah. that you changed, you know, yeah. something for you changed. Mm-hmm. So, what changed? I saw that the opposition was a lot stronger than I uh, had originally estimated that it was, and the opposition being the the forces that tend to drive humanity towards complacency and. Uh, Towards barbarism, than than towards uh, growth and uh, towards uh, you know darkness. Well, we call it what you will. You know, there, there's a uh, uh, a parable from the Greek Orthodox Church where uh, there's this saint that's praying and uh, he asks an angel to show him a vision of hell, and uh, the angel takes him to a place where there's these people. They're they're sitting around a table. The table is uh, full of uh, anything that they can imagine uh, to eat and drink, but they're all starving to, to death because uh, they are forced to use these very long spoons that they can't reach their mouth. So while they have all these uh, food and, and drink in front of them, they're they're all hungry and and, and cursing and wailing and, and and you know the rest. And then he asks him to show him heaven, and it's exactly the same scene except the people are using the spoons to feed each other because Mm -hmm. the length of the spoon is so much that you can reach the person across from you on the table and everybody was happy and smiling and this and that. So um, what what I've seen uh, in the world in in the last 20 years is that uh, unfortunately the the forces, the energy, the the societal trends, if you will, that, that want us to not help each other have become far more powerful than those that want us to help each other. So, I mean, for you, it was a process of disillusionment. Would you say that you're disillusioned? Um, no, no, I'm not disillusioned. I'm, I'm uh, still very much uh, teaching a small group of people. Mm-hmm. I'm, uh, I'm actually. Uh, a contributor to some things for NATO. I, uh, I do a lot of work with uh, the Greek military. Um, you know, I have my life. I live my life uh, with uh, with my friends, and, and I try to help whoever I can. Uh, what I became uh, aware of is that efforts like those uh, initiated by uh, Costa Danaos need uh, they're they're not the world is not set up to to receive them in a general way um, first off because people want to take a pill and and become John Chang I mean let's say uh, I received a uh, hundred thousand letters mm-hmm. and and out of those ninety nine thousand nine hundred and ninety eight were asking me for John Chang's uh, address in Indonesia because they just knew that you know it was their turn to to go there and become, uh, you know, the, the next heir apparent and, and, the, and the master of the universe. Because uh, the, the the problem with the the story of the Magus of Java is that it, it offered power, and and truly, John Chang uh, was a very powerful man. He was the the doctor for the dictator Suharto. He was treating the the Sultan of Brunei. You know, he was very very well known, and and he moved freely. Uh, among the wealthy of uh, Southeast Asia at the time, though he himself is, is started out as a, a simple taxi driver, you know, um, he had never studied, and and it was quite touching that uh, one of his ambitions was to to try to get a college degree. So um, the the world that that he lived in allowed for him to do that. The world that we live in, I don't think 
tolerates this type of thing. We, we need to get much more smarter and, and uh, much more humble and, uh, and understand that we actually do need to, to feed each other with a long spoon across the table uh, if we're going to solve the, the, the very serious problems that, that are facing us nowadays. So I got a lot smarter. Uh, I concentrate uh, on those that I can offer my, uh, my best efforts to. I still try to help the world, uh, but I do it you know, in, in a more simple fashion than, than that that uh, was dreamed of by, uh, by Costa de Naus. Hmm. Um, you know, I, I find it fascinating, the whole experience, the, the reading the book and, you know, what, I mean, you, it was, it was a very ambitious effort that you had. It was. To too go. ambitious. Too ambitious. Exactly. I mean, why, why, why would you say that? I mean, I, I think, I mean, I think it took a lot of ambition it, to. It wasn't you know, strategic, Savior. This is the, the age where, um. Uh, we need to to program our uh, campaigns and, and spread them out uh, across long distances and time. We've made mistakes as a species that, that we need to survive. And what's coming uh, over the next 10 years will be far worse than the previous 10. Bad things are coming. And so what we need to do is uh, hunker down, ride out the, sp the storm, and... I hope when the dust clears, we'll be able to pick up the pieces and, and uh, continue where we were and proceed to the next plateau. When you, when you say bad things are coming, I mean, mm -hmm. are you talking about you know, recent events like this push towards war with Iran? I mean, what are you talking about when you say bad things? Well, let's, uh, let's take war off the table because you never know when war is going to come or go. Um, if you read all the strategic analysis that have been put out in the next uh, over the past three years, everybody is uh, expecting a major war. But let's just go. Let's uh, stay with the climate. You know, I mean, uh, you have at the moment there's uh, 100 people, 100 million people in Nigeria, of which 70 million can't feed themselves. Where are they going to go? What are we going to do with them? Well, I can tell you what's going to happen. They're going to come north to Europe. And that's going to cause a lot of social strife, which we're already seeing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what are we going to do? Are we going to push them in the sea? Are we going to open up our arms and welcome them? Are we going to, you know, do what? Build a wall. Your guess is it's, uh, could be, maybe <laughs> that, you know. I mean, you, you've heard that in the U.S. So, and it's a little bit of the same thing. But these pressures that we've uh, put on our ecosystem and, and our societal structures uh, are going to reach a peak uh, probably over the next uh, five to six years, and then things are going to get very bad, and then hopefully things will get a lot better. So what I think is that uh, because technology will, um, I remember from my chemical engineering degree, one of the major factors were the quote-unquote kinetics of an equation, uh, of a reaction, and that was um, how fast a particular reaction takes in order to... Uh, to materialize so mm -hmm. the the kinetics of the degradation now are, are stronger than our capacity to to deal with them but maybe technology will protect will continue to advance to the point where we can actively turn things around and then you'll see the the kinetics going the other way and then we can reclaim our civilization so you know so you think you think it's it's going to get much worse until it gets better as far as what's I, going on ecologically I'm, with population the explosion of population I'm convinced of that yes I mean I don't necessarily disagree with you I mean a part of me really wants to be an idealist about everything that's going on in the world but it's it's harder and harder to be that way because everything is so connected we know, we we seem to know more about things than ever before but you know we 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 claim to be connected via social media facebook twitter updates but we don't talk to our neighbors we don't look at each other in the eye anymore you know and it's it's as if systemically things have changed when when you when you talk to someone in person they're so used to just texting you it's almost like it creates a sense of anxiety for them 
there you go. You, you've just uh, expounded uh, very clearly on, on part of the problem, yeah. So, so this, this association is also part of it. There, there's a lot of things. It, it's a fractal uh, problem. It's not something that, you know, you can identify. Uh, well, you can identify it, but you can't say, you know, this is it because it's, there's so many components to, to the change, the, the paradigm shift that, that uh, we've gone through. And, and we haven't uh, really been in a position to either deal with it or, or understand its long-term effects. And therefore, things are going to get worse before they can clear up. It's not the first time this has happened. You know, I mean, you, if you look at the history of, uh, of humanity, uh, even in the last couple hundred years, uh, paradigm shifts like this have, have come around and, and, and brought sure. You know, lots of change and, and, and different uh, periods uh, with them. You know, two world wars because of them, for example. You know, so, I mean, the, the Vedas called this the Kali, the age of the Kali Yuga. And, you they know, did. We, were ta- we were talking to Graham Hancock last week, and I, I think I read somewhere in his work that there was, there was going to be this end of the Kali Yuga somewhere around 2022 was where we were going to be reaching sort of the end of this cycle. And as you said, it is a cyclical process that happens, you know, in cycles. Yes. So uh, I, I call it, here's, here's one for you, for, for your uh, listeners. Okay. It, it's not a cyclical cycle. It's a helical cycle. Okay. So we're always advancing, and yet we're not learning from our mistakes and going through the same same thing, you know, kind of where we're, we're going through the dark and light periods of this advance, uh, always a little bit further along, but still doomed to go back through the same uh, morass, uh, if, if you will. Um, now, here's what's, what's really interesting about this. Uh, the Greek word for, for evolution is exelixi, okay. which, which means from the helix. Okay. It's an ancient word. And what was the helix? Were they talking about what I just talked, or did they know what DNA was? Because DNA, of course, is helical. So, again, if you look at things uh, fractally, my- macrocosmically and microcosmically, you know, you see the same spiral manifesting itself always, all over, in everything that we do. Who knows? You know, maybe we'll come through the curve and... and uh, proceed up to the next uh, plateau so I mean I mean it, obviously this whole quest it put you on this journey you know whether it was an internal awakening that you experienced I mean most people don't really experience people you know levitating setting things on fire or these other things you know so do you think do you I mean certainly this had an impact on your life that changed you forever Mm, it certainly had an impact on my life. Did it change me forever? You don't think so? Um, I don't know. I've uh, I've always been kind of that way, trying to to find different things. Um, uh, it's it certainly provided me with uh, enhanced awareness, and uh, certainly gave me greater experiences. Um, I think I'm still pretty much the same person I was uh, when I was a teenager. I mean, I always had the the same kind of uh, worries and quests and, and uh, looking around for, for different things. Uh, I don't think it's fundamentally changed my, my personality. I, I'm very happy that I experienced it. Uh, but, but then again, uh, you know, it's, it wasn't uh, an Apostle Paul uh, moment. I didn't encounter... Uh, Jesus on, on, on the road and, and uh, I didn't no enlightenment become, you know. no no it was uh, it was uh, one more thing that uh, that I said wow okay way cool and then uh, let's just keep walking that's really intriguing I you know I, I didn't expect that I didn't expect that from I'm like what did you ever find out what happened to Master Chong oh I, he's on Facebook <laughs> Oh yeah, his his whole family. No, I mean it's not. Uh, again, this is you have to take the Luke Skywalker. Although I, I you know, I, I make fun of that uh, all the time. But these are these are 
very, you know, the people have normal lives, you know, I mean, it's just, sure, sure. Uh, it's just uh, a part of what they do is, is also this, you know, it's like, uh, if you're a musician, you, you go out on a gig and then you come home and watch TV, you know, I mean, that's, uh, it just happens, you know, it's, uh, of course, that's, I mean, there is a very mystical quality to all this stuff. I mean, there, there are seekers, people who are out there that are meditating and they're, they're looking for answers. And part of this is understanding this, this energy system that's in within the human body that science has yet to give a language to. It's getting very, very closer, much closer. We're understanding the effects of the mind uh, on the body uh, much more than we ever did. Uh, fundamentally, we're beginning to to realize that that the mind can affect the body in ways that were hitherto uh, deemed, you know, uh, unacceptable or madness or, or whatever you want to call it. Basically, uh, what we've established and what we are in the process of establishing uh, would would be better is that. If you fundamentally believe something with all your uh, your heart, you can affect physiological uh, changes on your body. Now, uh, I don't think the, that uh, anyone can can disregard that nowadays. The question is, why are you doing it? You know, I mean, are you are you studying Tibetan Tumo meditation uh, to stay warm in the uh, in the snow? Buy a down jacket. It's you know, it's <laughs> it's. It's a lot cheaper, you know, you don't spend all this time on it, you know, <laughs> there, there's so many other things to do. I mean, if it, it, why are you doing this? That's that's a key question. Um, I've been privileged in, uh, in this life to meet uh, more than one person that was considered uh, holy by his uh, respective culture. I mean, I... I uh, I'm Greek, and, and uh, I had the privilege of uh, meeting uh, a man who is now considered a saint, Saint Paisios, and, and I saw some wonderful things with him as well. He wasn't a saint at the time; he was just a monk that was, you know, living in seclusion. He became a saint much after he died. Uh, I don't think there was any distinction between the man and, and, and his image. But, but the point is, is that um, all the people that, that I've seen that that had these uh, gifts or, you know, uh, the, the things that, that we want to, uh, to say were so outside of, uh, of conventional reality, were very simple, plain people, you know? John Chang loved to, to, to watch football on TV. That was his thing, you know? So it, it wasn't... Uh, a Tibetan temple with the lamas, uh, you know, uh, singing their 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 mantras. It wasn't uh, anything up on a pedestal. It was, um, you know, like I was telling you before we started the the uh, program. It was more like jaded Luke. I mean, his concern was, you know, how he was going to milk the uh, whatever it was in the morning in order to get his morning breakfast. Uh, wasn't that he was any different? It wasn't that it wasn't in an organized Jedi temple with all the ring bells and whistles and external trappings, you know. Uh, in in one sense, I see that far more healthy than than the ritual and and the pompous grandiosity that's associated with the latter. In in many respects, one thing that that turned me off so much was that, well, Chong Yun Trungpa <clears throat> wrote a book called Cutting Through Spiritual Materialism, where he put forth the first time that I read it, the, the theory that uh, a lot of people follow spirituality uh, because they cannot feed their ego otherwise in life. You know, okay, you know, I, I, um, I've never managed to, to do anything much with, uh, with my life. But, you know, I'm a uh, ninth level guru of this yoga system, blah, blah, blah. Uh, that, that is... A very serious mistake, and and that was the experience that I had with uh, when I uh, courted my, I had my brief uh, flirtation with fame. Uh, was that most of the the people that uh, were coming to me didn't really want to study or, or do the training that that I had done. Uh, they wanted to feed their own egos, and that is a fundamental, very 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 poisonous mistake. Mm -hmm. So. You felt that this was a, 
a search for just you know an ego thing like you know power hungry for, for, for me or for no, the for, for these others. other people uh, that were looking for this a, a large portion of that yes they wanted some type of power to enhance their their status in life and all of these are in the end of the day monastic techniques so they were designed to uh, be basically cultivated by by monks or warrior monks people who had said uh, no to society in the first place so you know if you think that you're going to use this to enhance your prestige in your in, in your neighborhood and and, uh, and open up a school it's just not going to work uh, the same way that if you go uh, and, and become a priest so that you will have you know uh, a position in society again it's not going to work it's it's going to cause uh, problems both for for you the church and, and the society that you supposedly want to serve um, we, we have to be very careful about our inner motivation for doing things I mean why are you doing this I, mine was very clear uh, like I said I, I saw what's happening now coming I was desperately trying to find a way to to contribute uh, towards making it go away it didn't work so I went back to work myself you know and I appreciate your perspective. I, I just want to say to anyone listening out there, if you have a question for Costas, now is the time to ask. We're going to begin wrapping up the show here shortly. So if you want to ask a question, you can send us a super chat or you can get into our Discord. The In the live show discussion, we are we will be taking questions for the next couple minutes. Um, you know, Costas, I mean, I... Did you did you end up writing any books after the Magus of Java? I wrote uh, one called Neikung, where I tried to. Uh, but by the way, I don't come up with these titles. The, the the titles that I came up with were very different from. Uh, uh, no, I did come up with the Magus of Java, but originally I was it was a different name, and the uh, Neikung was again a, a title that uh, that the the editor uh, chose. Uh, I think I, I had originally called it Embracing the Lightning or something like that. Anyway, it was uh, a book where I compared these different uh, methods that, that I had uh, seen or experienced that were similar to the, the Mopai meditation and, and try to wrap them up in a historical context and, and also put some stories of uh, you know, different uh, things that, that I had experienced there. Did you find any resistance uh, when you were, you know, publishing the book or the material through the editors or the publishing companies? Does that happen? No, no. Nothing like that. No, no, no. Everybody was wonderful. Uh, nothing like that. Okay, that's. I mean, that's good to hear that that the information was something that, you know, wasn't pushed back against. No, no, it was. Uh, it was fine. Uh, again, it, it was a, I think, much more welcoming world uh, before nine eleven, and uh, so that that. No, that wasn't there. I mean, the the sense that I get, Costas, from you is, you know, things things really changed. And I mean, do you think do you think for yourself that, you know, maybe your perspective shifted into like you know, changing the system from within the system? I don't know. What's Jaded Luke doing on that water, uh, watery island planet or whatever it is that? Uh, yeah. I mean, that's the way you regard yourself as this, you know, jaded Luke. Like you're the no, no. It's it's just a very humorous uh, <laughs> prototype that I felt like using. You know, I don't know where I, why I've latched onto that. But, I mean, what uh, what what happened to you, man? I mean, there's something. You know, it seems like something happened that it it, it almost feels like it burnt you out a little bit. You know, if I if I may speak a little bit frankly. Oh, you can speak as frankly as you want. Uh, well, a number of things, a uh, number of things happened. Yeah, uh, part of them were changes in the in the world. Uh, it's overall part of them were things that happened to me. You know, it's it's never, it's very rarely one thing that okay. uh, gets you down. It's the you know, like like they say, the final straw that broke the camel's back, quote unquote. Um, but I just realized that, you know, for, for I myself, I, I had to uh, to do what I'm doing now. I mean, was it a was it a money thing? You know, did you? Oh, no. God, no. I don't know. It was never money. Um, I've always been uh, able to fulfill my fiduciary obligations by engaging in one profession or the other. 
So, I mean, that's interesting. It's it's really interesting. I'm trying to dig a little bit, trying to push a little bit against, you know, whatever whatever this is that was going on with you that changed your perspective on this so much. But I mean, you yourself said that you still you still practice the art. I mean, you still teach. And I, you, I you don't do- practice. I don't practice the the Mopai art. I, I practice martial arts. Uh, okay. I practice a, a traditional Greek form called Pamachun. Um, which uh, it's uh, it was uh, basically a 19th century uh, Greek martial art um, that that uh, I've it's kind of fallen into my lap, let's say, and uh, and and I try to help people and and, and teach people and uh, share some things that I understand uh, about uh, over the decades that I, that I've been studying these things, but. Um, I do not uh, teach uh, any, and I'm not authorized to teach any of the uh, systems that, that I had uh, discussed in this conversation. I, I don't teach Tai Chi. I'm not a Tibetan Buddhist. I don't teach the Mopai system, nor am I authorized to. Uh, you know, I I do other things now. Have you had any contact with? You know, the people, you know, Master John. Did you did you have any contact with him again after you left? Oh sure, why not? And what about recently? Uh, not for a while, no. But uh, that's probably oversight on my part more than anything else. So it's just something you know where you just sort of lost touch and maybe yeah, even you, interest. You, know, you 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 sometimes drift away. You know, and then maybe send a Christmas card or something like that. You know, it's uh, very typical, I think, in human relations. It's, it's really it's really interesting. I mean, you know, I I I really enjoyed the book, and you know, I, I found it fasc- I found it fascinating the the journey you went through, and you know what it took. And I remember in the email you just said, you know, you just flat out said that you were a young man back then. And yeah, so- it was a good road trip. You know, you, you know, road movies <laughs> type of thing. But it was a great road trip. That that, that so I figured, you know, uh, it's well worth a book. You know, something something you wrote in Magus of Java was that you said that you we need a new science that is neither Eastern or Western. I believe that still. I do believe that still. Yes, very much believe that. I, I think there is a uh, an epigraph. Uh, there, it's a, a saying that is on a sixth century Greek Orthodox Christian temple that uh, originated in a, uh, with a uh, 5th century uh, B.C. Greek philosopher uh, called Plato. And uh, he refers to it, and it apparently came from an even earlier philosopher of, uh, let's say, the previous century, so 6th century, called Anaxagoras. And what it says is that mind shapes and creates all things. Well, the, Einstein said, pretty much the same thing. So I think that uh, the next boom in science isn't going to be uh, fifth generation telecommunications or even AI. It's going to be our understanding of how our consciousness or consciousness in general shapes reality and how it can affect reality. Yeah, I agree with that. I, I think that science is uncovering this more and more. I mean, we've got people like Dean Radin out there. We've got Rupert Sheldrake out there, and they're they're studying the effects of the mind on matter. Exactly, exactly. I mean, we've co- we've covered this thoroughly on this show, in fact, and you know, it's 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 a topic that's close to you know what I'm thinking. So, do, I mean, do you think that your perspective on the overall outcome of you know where the world is headed is is more of a viewpoint or, or something, you know, like, because, you know, based on what we just said that, you know, what we think becomes real. I think that our minds are fundamentally connected at a very basic level. I think that, um, let's say that there's an internet, uh, amongst ourselves that, you know, maybe we upload into when we go into, uh, REM sleep or, or something like that, but uh, but I believe that we all are connected. So uh, it is in fact our our mass unconscious mind that directs the the flow or the, the stream of things uh, where we're heading. And I believe that at this point in time, 
our mass subconscious is directing it towards a, a darker place. Uh, and I think that when we understand more and more how our conscious mind can affect our subconscious and in fact uh, shapes and creates all things, then maybe we can turn that around. But before we do that, we need to hunker down because winter is coming. So, uh, you know. Okay, okay, man. Yeah. I mean, all right, I, I've got a question here from Mysterious Stranger. He sends it through uh-huh. our Discord. It's a bit of a long question here. I'll start, try to read it out. Um, when one comes to accept the lack of inherent purpose, we aren't born with one or are part of a great master plan, still the only path that makes sense or the one that is most in sync with the world is that of inner growth to flourish. So how could you manage to keep that purpose close to heart without falling into a neurotic mindset when you know how bad things will get? Um, I'm, I'm pretty tough. Uh, in the sense that, you know, uh, it's the only fight that's worth fighting. Why give up? You know, I mean, uh, if you have to crash, you might as well do it with style. So uh, the, there's nothing. It's, it's warrior tradition. It's the best tradition around, you know, like uh, like the Spartans told the, the Persian uh, emissary when he said that our arrows are going to blot it blot out the uh, sun and uh, the Aniki censored all well, good at least we'll fight in the shade so uh, it's the same thing I, I don't despair uh, what I try to do is as I mentioned earlier handle it from a uh, logistics and strategic uh, standpoint I see how far my own energy goes and how far my own resources goes and, and I say okay I'm going to help these many people and get these many people straight and then maybe these people can help another dozen people and those other dozen people and so forth and so on what I'm not going to try to do is overextend my flank and get swamped um, you, you need a, a significantly larger resource base uh, to do that I mean uh, John Kennedy uh, lit a match and and put man on the moon and what was it uh, eight years I think wasn't it 61 where he said that uh, we need to go to the moon and and uh, uh, I remember the speech, yeah, something like that. Something like that, uh, and I think so. It was eight years, and in '69 we we did, but that was the the uh, resources of a very inspired nation, and you know it just it was a passion that swept everybody away, and and uh, and we did it. We managed to do it. Um, I don't see this type of inspiration and incentive and this type of vision and dream. Uh, prevalent anywhere so what I need to do or what everybody needs to do is is say okay we need to do good things fine how many people can I assist in doing good things one two three that's it I'm not going to overextend myself if I help these three they might help another four and so forth and so on and and I think that's the way that you avoid becoming bitter and, and burnt out you know i mean uh when you're in a firefight you take cover and you shoot back when you can so you're saying that we should affect change within our own communities and the people that are close absolutely to us. your own families your own communities your circles your whatever you can i don't care if it's over the internet don't try to affect ten thousand people leave that for kim kardashian try to affect one two seven that you know you can impact their lives and let those seven impact another seven and grow exponentially that way. So Kosas, maybe I got the wrong impression from you, man, and I apologize for that. I got the impression that, you know, you disconnected from this because you, you know, you gave up in a way, but you didn't, you didn't give up at all. No, 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 no. Just became smarter. And... You know, in in the sense of being smarter, you just mean more strategic, affecting those people close to you and implementing that change for the people, you know, that were in your daily life, maybe. You need to be subtle when you, you know, like a, a special forces operation, it's, it's not a bunch of people, it's not a battalion, it's a small group. And then you, they do things by being more mobile and quiet and, and, uh, and, and getting the job done and, uh. I think that's how we need to to handle the tasks at hand. We we need to be smarter, and then we need to 
uh, not uh, spread ourselves out too thin. And, and, and that's what I'm saying. I mean, what was it that Buddha said? Like one candle flame to another, right? Absolutely. Skillful means. Skillful means. Kostas, I, I really appreciate your time, oh my good sir. Where can, where can people find your work? Where can people find more about you? www.pamachon.gr P-A-M-M-A-C-H-O-N dot G-R is my website. And are you, are you working in, on anything these days, right now, lately? I mean, is there anything that people should look out for? Are you, are you I mean, where are you? Are you li- you're living in, in Greece, right? No, I'm in Brussels now at the moment, actually. Okay. But, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm a kind of a globetrotter in some senses. Um, I'm in Brussels, yeah. So you're but keeping Greece, Greece is home. Okay, and I mean, are you are you working on anything new? Are you working on a new book anytime soon, or anything like that? A new book. Uh, we are consolidating an an, an effort that uh, will probably go public in in 2021. Um, I really can't talk about it yet, but it's it's coming. All right, Costas. Well, guys, here's another episode, and you know, I, I, I really want to recommend this book. It's called The Magus of Java, The Teachings of an Authentic Taoist Immortal by my guest, uh, Costa Danaus. And, you know, I, I really think you guys should give this book a read. I, I really enjoyed it. it. It was a different perspective. It, it, I actually sat down and read it, read it last night, and I read the whole thing last night. So, um, we are going to get out of here. If, if you enjoyed the show, please share it. We are building a YouTube presence. Uh, we're, we're, we're attempting to do that. If you really enjoy the show, buy us a coffee. Help us keep the show running. And we will see you guys next week.